Um, all right, so to start off, uh, we'll have Rakef uh, start us off with a word of welcome. So feel free to, uh, to take over Rakef. start my video because it says the host has stopped i think we probably can you just enable uh uh enable screen sharing the or enable video. Your yeah enable video one second here it should be in the security session uh, section enable video sorry So are you having trouble sharing your screen or? No, 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 just just starting my video. Oh, starting your video. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see. So is this okay, on the never mind right then. side? Never mind, then it's, then we're fine. We, we, we go yeah. through it, yeah. Sure. Well, okay, thanks everyone for connecting. Uh, we are very excited to have you all join us for this year's summer school, uh, the 2023 Jetscape. And should also say, Xscape summer school, right? Because we're kind of moving into the next, uh, into the next arena here. So we're really looking forward to have you all uh, learn about the framework, play with it, uh, run your own simulations, and then. Uh, Towards the end of it, you know, you'll have a good handle on producing some pretty cool plots. So that's going to be the agenda. So we have two weeks, right? So week one is going to be more of a kind of an introduction level. And then we'll have a little bit more detailed uh, as we get, as we head into week two with different topics. So we always try to have uh, lots of time for questions. So this is meant as sort of a really a school, right? In which case you're learning material. Uh, please have your questions ready. When you have, you, you know, when you listen to your talk and you have a question, put it in the Slack chat for the day, right? So you all should have, have access to the general Slack for the summer school and then go into the individual day. So we have hashtag 17 and 18, I believe. Uh, particular channel. So put your question there. We have people monitoring both the Slack. And if you forget and you put it into the Zoom chat here, we, we will also put it there, right? So make sure you keep the Slack for questions and then we can then ask that to the speakers. And then hopefully we have a very productive discussion. So that's essentially the ground rules here. So let's get started. The first, uh, we will have Jorn uh, Puchka to talk about the framework. So actually, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to Simon. Yes, sounds great. So uh, Jorn, uh, you can uh, share your screen and we can start off with the first lecture. Awesome. All right, so take it away. And I'll see my screen. Looks okay. good on my end. Okay, I'm also not uh, able to start my video, but uh, that's okay. Uh, so uh, welcome again to uh, the Jetscape Online School in 2023. Uh, so this is the first school where we actually uh, will discuss the uh, Xscape framework or more importantly, uh, I will try to explain uh, what the differences and commonalities are between the Jetscape and Xscape framework. So there is a little bit of, a, uh, let's say, in, in uh, uh, potential confusion. So our collaboration is still the Jetscape collaboration. Uh, and we have one product, which is Jetscape, and the other product is Xscape. But to some extent, Xscape will be supported by the Jetscape collaboration. So, okay, so I'll, I'll try to be also a little bit more precise during this uh, lecture, uh, what I mean when I refer to, uh, refer to Jetscape where this Xscape uh, functionalities. Okay, so with that said, um, let me remind you again uh, that we have uh, a Slack channel uh, you can ask problems if, or you can ask questions if you have problems uh, installing the Jetscape slash slash Xscape uh, 
framework using the Docker environment. Um, so I hope you all got uh, an email and instructions on how to do this. And I hope that uh, it will be uh, not too, too complicated and in particular uh, uh, that you don't run into too many issues. But if they are, please use the Slack channel because every time you might have an issue, there might be a reasonable chance that other people also will have uh, the same issue and it's way easier to archive things on Slack. So I'm just repeating what uh, Raghav was saying. So please use the Slack channel rather than the uh, Zoom chat. Um, um, you're in a quick comment. So I think you can actually share video figured out the settings. So okay. That is shot. Okay. There you go. Excellent. Okay. Right. So very quickly, I'm not sure if this is more helpful or not, uh, but okay. Uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, more personal if we do it like this, uh, unless we end up in issues with uh, with uh, uh, my bandwidth. Okay. Um, with that said, uh, uh, I want to then further also uh, uh, point out that uh, also as Raghav said, so we have for the different sessions, uh, we do have uh, different Slack channels to organize it. So if you have a question with respect to, uh, to this uh, particular talk, then uh, uh, go ahead and uh, ask the question in the Slack channel. And we will try to stop frequently enough throughout the, the lecture so that we can try to answer your questions unless they are uh, easily answered uh, in the Slack channel itself. Okay, so, uh, um, so the Jetscape uh, uh, and Xscape uh, so sorry, I have to remove a little bit here the things from uh, Zoom. So what is Jetscape and Xscape? Um, so broadly speaking, uh, Jetscape and Xscape includes two components. Um, the one side is the framework and the event generator, which in the case of Xscape, and I will explain this in more detail throughout the lecture is a general purpose Monte Carlo event generator, which now includes also a component in the future about uh, EIC, so electron ion collisions, uh, small system, PEP, and proton uh, 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 ion collisions, and of course, uh, heavy ion collisions. So this is one aspect of it. And the other one, uh, big part of it is the statistical uh, toolkit, so which basically extract models parameters via Bayesian analysis uh, with the Gaussian process emulators. And so this is uh, a separate topic and I will be focusing today uh, on the framework and the event generator aspect uh, of Jetscape. So Jetscape, and Xscape, and it will become abundantly clear in particular in the extension of Jetscape and Xscape, that Jetscape is not only for jets. So it's a framework for general purpose event generators. And the two things which makes it a general purpose event generator, and we will go through the uh, technical realization of this, is that the Jetscape framework is modular, so the core framework decides how physics modules can interact with each other, but the modules itself, so the physics uh, you want to add uh, to it uh, is user contributed. So you can put in the physics you like while utilizing everything else, which is already implemented. And the second aspect is that physics modules are open source. So this is a key improvement uh, in particular in heavy ion physics. So predictions can be checked against many observables simultaneously. Uh, and of course, people can freely use it. So therefore a unified framework in particular has clear benefits when we want to compare models uh, of one particular aspect of it, if we have multi-stage event evolution as we have 
and heavy ion collisions. So the current status is that, uh, so we have uh, two GitHub repositories. So we have the latest version of Jetscape is 3.5.4 uh, and can be found at the link uh, 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 you see on the slide. And the other is our first Xscape 1.0 release, um, which happens uh, uh, beginning of this year. So both frameworks are available and ready for public use. Uh, there's a wide variety of physics already available and additions are ongoing and will be added in, in subsequent releases. Uh, so I think it's an ideal time to utilize this framework and add additional physics modules. So before I make a break here, you see that I have a little pause button uh, on the lower right corner uh, to see if there are questions. Uh, I want to point out what is the difference between the Jetscape and the Xscape framework, or if you go to one or the other on the GitHub repository and download it. So Xscape is fully backwards compatible to Jetscape. So that means that Xscape 1.0 as it is on uh, and you download it from the GitHub, includes and can be run exactly as uh, Jetscape 3.5.x. Uh, and let's say that you can use uh, a Jetscape mode in the Xscape framework. And I'll try to clarify what that means. So why is this important? Because uh, at some point and pretty soon, uh, if we look at our uh, intended release maps, uh, is that Jetscape 3.6 will be the last uh, release of the Jetscape uh, framework and uh, on that GitHub, which includes a new feature and new physics. So in particular, fragmentation hadrons and smash, and I'm sure that there will be a hands-on session. Uh, discussing this in more details. The only other update we envision is a, four, a Jetscape 4 release, which will basically purely be focused on code optimization to basically uh, increase efficiency and minimize runtime. So with this said, after 3.6, we are basically uh, adding no new features uh, from a physics perspective to the Jetscape repository. However, the Xscape uh, release map basically then naturally includes a 1.1 update, which will include the new physics of the Jetscape 3.6. Since it's fully backwards compatible, uh, after that, uh, there is no particular need to uh, not use Xscape because you can always uh, run it as is in Jetscape mode. Our second release will be, uh, hopefully by the end of the year, will be focusing on low beam energy, uh, heavy ion collision. And then in the future, the three uh, Xscape 3 release will include some EIC physics. So just to clarify, so in this lecture, if I refer to Jetscape, so then you see a logo here in the upper right corner, uh, I refer to running Xscape 1.0 in Jetscape mode. So we are not using the Jetscape uh, GitHub repository for this school, and I will uh, explain this in the next slide. If I refer to Xscape, so you see then the logo of Xscape in the upper right corner, I refer to Xscape 1.0 specific functionalities which are not part of Jetscape. So, and if you see both logos, then naturally that means these are commonalities of the two frameworks, in particular uh, data structures and so on. Okay, so at this moment, uh, I will pause for a second in case we have some questions. So there's one question on, on Slack that has just been um, asked, uh, and maybe I just read that and, uh, <clears throat> we'll also answer it on Slack, uh, like in writing, so that there is an archive version. But um, the question is, uh, do Xscape and Jetscape run with the same, if they are run with the same settings, do they produce identical data? So yes. are they interchangeable in that way? 
Yes, absolutely. So this is what we mean with fully backwards compatible. If the settings are identical, the output is identical. And um, we do have uh, GitHub action checks, which actually ensure this, uh, that, uh, that, that they are identical. So indeed, you can, you can think about that Xscape one or the Xscape framework really is just uh, 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 Jetscape, but new functionality. So it's interchangeable. Nothing else in Slack right now. Okay. All right. So then I then I move on. Um, so installing uh, Xscape. Um, so we have, uh, of course, uh, 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 tutorials and explanations on our wiki, and I hope you also got uh, additional uh, information uh, for specific for the school. Uh, so they are basically two main ways to, to install and run Xscape. One is using a kind of a containerized environment. Um, and the other one is uh, you install it manually. So you specific for your framework. So we really do not recommend this because uh, as you can envision, uh, there are several issues with uh, having different architectures and setups. Uh, so we really recommend for uh, local use and development to use Docker. Uh, and we have instructions on how to do this Xscape and Jackscape uh, using the Docker environment. Or if you uh, uh, want to run on, on, on large scale computing farms, uh, due to some of the aspect of uh, 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 kind of like access and, and settings, uh, they usually don't use Docker, uh, so they use something like Singularity. However, all of these uh, 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 different environments usually uh, have some way of converting uh, a Docker container into, into their uh, 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 specification. So as said, so we really uh, encourage everyone to- John, we can't hear you. Docker container. Sorry? Abhijit? Still cannot hear you. You cannot hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. You're fine. Okay. Yeah, okay. Everything's going smoothly. Question in the, oh, sorry, Reiner, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, we have another question, Slack. Uh, would that be a good uh, time since we got interrupted anyway, to just yeah, sure. insert that quickly? Yeah. Uh, I think it's still, because it's still sort of for the previous one where it was Jetscape versus Xscape. The question is, what's the main reason behind switching from Jetscape to Xscape? And uh, I don't know what the, what aspect of that question is sort of more important. I mean, on the user side or why we as a collaboration collaboration sort of chose to make Xscape? Maybe you can address both quickly, uh, Jorn. Okay, so from a from a user perspective, it really just depends what function. Uh... Abhijit, you are sometimes speaking. Okay. I think he's in Maybe another- Maybe logging on and logging back in. Using the wrong Zoom unmute. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, okay. Um, so from a user perspective, it really just depends. So if you never have any intention to use the new physics, which I will try to briefly outline later of Xscape, then to some extent, there's no, um, no reason to use, uh, uh, the Xscape framework, you can just stick to Jetscape. Um, however, as you might later later see, uh, uh, to have a real distinction has to do uh, with the initial emphasis on the jet aspect of Jetscape. Uh, so you will see later on, and if you run it, you might wonder why uh, Xscape explicitly has to introduce clocks or a main clock to synchronize. And this has to do with the uh, emphasis of Jetscape on jets, where basically the time evolution was purely driven and hidden from the user 
by the parton shower evolution. So there is a fundamental switch in the framework capabilities of uh, uh, basically being way more uh, flexible and um, independent and uh, to some extent allow full concurrency of of all modules uh, and also we open up a little bit the uh, how you access and exchange information so from this perspective it feels like that uh, it it is a little bit more uh, of uh, of an update uh, so that it warrants its own name in particular uh, since they are completely new physics aspects so I'm not entirely sure if this really answered the question, but that uh, uh, that's the main reason. Yeah, if uh, uh, Jita, if you have any follow-up questions, please just post on, on Slack. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Okay, good. Um, so I said here, uh, I will have some comments uh, if time allows about uh, uh, our our experience with large scale simulations. Uh, but again, so please use, uh, if possible, the Docker environment for local use and development. Uh, so it really has the advantage that uh, uh, if you use the the Docker container, that all of the software prerequisites and all of the versions which might be needed are really a one line of code so you just pull the docker container and you have everything you needed uh, in order to then uh, download the repository and install uh, xscape so for this school we indeed uh, require you to run xscape uh, via docker because this allows a real uniform environment and makes troubleshooting significantly easier than having to go through different software architectures and local installations. Okay, so here I will pause only quickly to remind people that if you uh, ran into issues uh, installing it, please use the software problem Slack channel. Okay, but more on containers. Uh, so uh, this year we also uh, 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 basically provide containers. Uh, so these are uh, really out of the box event generators. So they're fully pre-compiled Xscape, Jetscape uh, for a specific version uh, and they are called Xscape and Jetscape full. Uh, so this is intended if you really don't want to develop or want to have any further insight into it, but you just want to uh, create uh, events, then don't bother with getting the GitHub uh, downloaded and compiled. This is all uh, included here. And I think this is probably the most uh, user-friendly approach if you just want to use it as an event generator. So this is literally uh, a one-line uh, uh, affair to get the full container on your local machine. And then we will go through how to change uh, settings in Jetscape and Xscape and execute it and look at the output. So just briefly emphasis on the Jetscape event generator. So this is mimicked and thought of to really um, allow you to have the full evolution of a heavy heavy iron invent in uh, event. So you, we have uh, all of these different boxes are different modules uh, in Jetscape. So we have an initial state aspect. We have then the soft sector with, uh, uh, with hydro and um, hadronization. We have the hard sector where you can you know, use Pythia or anything else to generate your hard scattering. We have different ways of uh, having a medium modified uh, pattern shower. So you can attach different physics aspects and you can change when their applicability depending on some change uh, uh, parameter like, like virtuality uh, in this particular case. And then we hadronize and all of this can then 
fed into uh, a further hadron cascade. So at the time of this, um, so we have uh, uh, basically several, several modules uh, and several implementations here uh, for each of the boxes. So we have Trento in different two plus one, three plus one, we have IP Glasma. The star here denotes that this is an optional download and you have to follow the instructions uh, uh, in, the, in the GitHub manual or in the manual to install this. Uh, so we have a free streaming, we have several different uh, hydro implementations, music, CLVisk, uh, and some simplified versions like a brick and a Gapsa a hydro. We have a Putia 8, a Parton gun, which just generates a, a fictitious uh, a, a Parton, but you could also add in here any module you like, uh, like Hervic and so on, if you want to use that. Uh, we have Meta, Pythia, LBT, Martini, ADS, CFTs. All of these can interact and exchange information, of course, with the Hydro, uh, different versions of Hadronization and uh, Smash as a Hadron Cascade uh, afterburner at this moment. So just briefly, so if you look at all of this, okay, well, so how do I actually now really run Jetscape or Xscape? So you basically just follow our instructions, you install and build Xscape in this particular case. Uh, you can create a configuration file, which is usually in the config part uh, of the uh, downloaded uh, uh, structure, so to speak, uh, and you have a Jetscape user XML file, and you can either use one of uh, the test ones, which is uh, provided, uh, or and however, you can uh, uh, basically uh, change everything which steers Jetscapes here, uh, and then you uh, execute uh, run Jetscape, and that's pretty much it. So this is, in a nutshell, how you uh, out of the box would run Jetscape, in particular, if you use from uh, uh, some of the already uh, predefined configuration files. But I will go through and uh, explain what you would have to do if you want to change and create your own XML file. So for this, Jetscape is configured. And again, and just a reminder here, Jetscape means that you run uh, the Xscape 1.0 GitHub repository in Jetscape mode, so to speak, uh, which is the default mode. So you don't have to worry uh, too much about that. And in particular, if you follow the XML skiering and you use the run Jetscape executable, uh, by default, it will act as the equivalent Jetscape version. So Jetscape is configured via two XML file. So we have a main XML file. This is something you shouldn't modify at all. It contains default values for every possible module and every parameter which is, uh, uh, which is needed and or can be used. And you have a user XML file. So you provide this or you use one of the uh, example files. For example, we have different tunes uh, uh, which are encoded in an XML file. And there you can change the list uh, and define of what modules you want to run uh, and what default parameters of these modules you want to override. So just... Uh, to, to, to give you a feeling here. So this is uh, a little excerpt of the, of the Jetscape uh, XML file, uh, main file, or uh, sorry for that in the older versions, it was uh, called uh, uh, in, an, in, an, in an old name, uh, but now it's the main file. And you can see here that you have, uh, uh, for example, here in the initial state module, uh, you have default parameters set for grid sizes, um, collision sizes, profile paths, and so on. All of these um, is basically a database of all possible mod modules and parameters. So 
if you want to configure Jetscape and you want to configure it to your needs and for specific settings, you provide a user XML file and you specify which modules you want to run. And this is done in the uh, in the uh, uh, XML notation. So uh, you can say that uh, if you have IS here, which stands for initial state, you want to have an initial state module uh, and you can here use Trento. Uh, then you have to provide a hard process. Uh, at this point in time, you use a P gun, but you can use Pythia, hydro, energy loss, hydronization, and so on. So you basically set up in your XML file what modules you want to run. Uh, and for each module, you can override uh, values if you so desire. Uh, and of course, you can also set your writer or what output uh, you want to use. And I will come back to that in a little. There is, however, one uh, aspect which you have to fulfill. So you have to activate, activate and put in the modules in order in your XML file, how they get executed. Uh, and of course, reflecting the the initial ordering of uh, uh, our heavy iron collisions. Okay, so at this moment, I will pause and see if there are some questions. Um, I had a quick question. Yes. Um, so when you refer to, um, so when you were on the slide of how to run Jetscape, um, mm -hmm. when you make the config file, uh, it says user, but should us as users replace that with some descriptive username or is it just user? No, you can, and on the next slide, you can see that you can specify the XML file name you want to use. Okay. Right. So you can, you can name it however you want. Uh, however, you then you have to explicitly uh, use as an as a, a parameter uh, as execution the name of the file. Uh, otherwise, by default, it will load the Jetscape underscore user dot XML. Okay, thank you. There's a question um, on Slack here. So, could one extract initial state results? Uh, from Jetscape and sort of look at them as final stage results. Uh, I suppose the trend or the free streaming, because uh, so somebody would like to sort of compare those results to their own. Is that does that yes. question make sense to you, Jorn? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, the short answer is in principle yes. <laughs> uh, the longer answer is. Uh, if you want to use something which you know is specific to the Trento or an initial state module and information which is not by default uh, written in uh, any of our uh, different output formats, uh, then you would have to provide your own output writer and I'll comment on that later. But yes, in principle, uh, it is possible. However, uh, I would recommend that, and hopefully this becomes uh, more obvious due to the changes in Xscape, uh, having a specific and more independent combination and, for example, completely ignoring uh, jet evolution or so, uh, uh, the the Xscape framework extension is, is better suited uh, to allow you such independence, but in principle, yes, but uh, it potentially requires a little bit of uh, coding if you want to have uh, particular information which are not part of our default output. Okay, I hope that answered it. If not, please uh, uh, put a follow-up question. All right, nothing else in Slack, on Slack. Okay. So then let me move on. And yes, uh, so this was the other question. Uh, so if you want to run Jetscape, so in particular, if you want to run uh, 
uh, Xscape and Jetscape mode, there's one central executable, which is run, uh, which is called run jetscape.cc, uh, which you also don't have to change. It's pre-compiled. So modules are automatically added according to your user XML file. You don't need to recompile. And if you don't use the uh, default XML, you can pass your user configuration file as a command line argument to it. So yes, you can name it however you want. Uh, of course, and this is just a remark here. So if you want to integrate other frameworks or completely different usages, uh, of course, which uh, require you to recompile, change the make file, uh, or really uh, uh, include other header files of that framework, uh, so we have examples, for example, where we have the full uh, fast jet uh, uh, environment and uh, also root environment. At this moment in time, then you have to write your own executable and extend the make files. Uh, and you can see some of these uh, examples uh, in the GitHub under example and custom examples. So if you want to use something which is outside or uh, not by default uh, uh, included in the framework, uh, then you can do this, but you have to provide your own executable file. So uh, broadly speaking, uh, uh, Jetscape and Xscape, so there's no change. The uh, output and the data structures are uh, uh, identical between them. Uh, in principle, we have two uh, broad uh, output formats. Um, and they usually contain the final state hadrons, the final state partons, and uh, depending on uh, uh, the exact format, uh, also the full parton shower history. So you can produce Jetscape uh, in our uh, proprietary format. Uh, which is an, an, an ASCII format. Uh, it's our custom Jetscape format. It contains a little bit more information and ways uh, in particular how to, to deal with graph structures, which I will allude to in a little bit. Uh, uh, you, can, you have the option of having the full part on shower history or only the final state particles. Uh, and you can, to save this space, you can uh, uh, write it directly into a GZIP ASCII format. And we provide the proper readers for it to get the information out. Or the other one is our standard uh, 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 format, which is HEPMC3. It's compatible with, uh, with the Ribbit. It's basically a standard format. Uh, you can either have it in, in an ASCII output or uh, in a recent update, we also allow you easily to use it in root. Uh, that depends a little bit on usage, but uh, the main advantage of the root output is that it's significantly less disk space than uh, HEPMC in ASCII format. However, as I already said and uh, alluded to in, in one of the question lists, you can easily write your own output class to tailor your specific needs uh, by inheriting from the Jetscape writer, uh, and you can basically then uh, pick and choose or add new information you want to write out, which are not uh, supported by default. And I will pause here for a little bit to see if there are some questions concerning output. So can people still hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay. So if there are no questions, uh, then I move no, on. No, we just got one. We just got one. Uh, Sorry? We just got a question. Yeah, let me read this. So can Xscape okay. provide temperature evolution of the system uh, during the hydro stage? So I guess the question is, is that written out? Uh, no. It's not written out by default. It's uh, too much information, but it's uh, uh, but it is possible to to access it. And we might have an example 
program somewhere, but certainly uh, you will. Uh, uh, we have one in a development where we kind of visualize the hydro evolution and we use that information. So uh, by default, not that would be too much. Uh, by default, if you write your own module, of course, during the uh, shower evolution and during the execution of it, you have full access to, to all the uh, information of uh, hydro at a particular time, but it's not written out by default as an output. That would be too much uh, this space. Okay. Thank you, nothing else on Slack right now. Okay, then I move on. Uh, so one very, very brief uh, 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 statement about the design and why we say it's modular and a little bit about the inner workings. Uh, so what you see here, it's basically the main building block on uh, of Jetscape and Xscape. So there's no change in that uh, approach. Uh, so it's a task-based C++ framework. So basically physics modules are daughter of classes of the Jetscape task and the Jetscape module base. Uh, and you are, can attach any task to any other task, then you have sub subtask and you can build your own hierarchy and in different orders and so on. So this is uh, why it's modular and flexible. And the framework automatically calls standard functions uh, of these modules uh, uh, to be integrated and they have to be defined by the user and you will do this in the hands-on session. Uh, and if you provide these tasks in your own, uh, you know, as you see here in, uh, in your own module, uh, like in a task, so setting up all the parameters, uh, execute the task and clear the task if you allocated uh, some memory, which should be freed up to avoid memory leaks. If you include and override these in your own module, then they get uh, automatically executed. However, there's one caution, and this is the only significant uh, uh, API change uh, between Jetscape and, 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 and Xscape. So it doesn't affect running Xscape in, in Jetscape mode, but it's important if you want to develop your own module. Uh, unfortunately, historically, we had some inconsistency in the way the recursiveness of all the task functions were executed. So we cleaned that up and we hope we uh, even had a better, uh, the naming convention is now better for the user. So in Jetscape, you had to override init exit finish clear. If you use uh, the Xscape GitHub, uh, we changed it and you have to uh, implement init task, execute task, finish task, clear task, uh, which I think we, we think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also a better naming convention. But in principle, that's literally the only difference on the source code level. Uh, and only important if you uh, implement your own module or you want to transfer your module developed uh, from the Jet uh, Jetscape GitHub uh, repo and to use in Xscape, you basically just have to rename init to init task and so on. So I will pause here uh, in case there are some questions, uh, but I'm pretty sure this will become more obvious in the hands-on session. There was actually a, a question on Slack for the previous uh, for the previous uh, slides, I think. Okay. Um, and the question was, um, if you could show where in the user config file, uh, or if it is even uh, if it is possible in the user config file to choose whether ASCII or root output. Yes. Uh, I mean, you will see this in the hands-on on session, but uh, so for example, here you have the Jetscape writer. So we have a, a Jetscape HAPMC root writer. And you would basically replace this line 
Jetscape writer ASCII, which uh, with Jetscape HEPMC3 root writer on, uh, and then you would have uh, HEPMC3 uh, in root format. In order to do this, however, you have to 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 compile uh, uh, Jetscape Xscape uh, with the uh, flag uh, use root in your CMake file because we don't require by default that root is there uh, and compiled in, even though in Docker it the proper root version is installed. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so one more aspect, and at some point, I uh, hope I'm not running too too late. Um, at some point, someone should remind me of the time. Uh, so in Jetscape, in Jetscape mode, uh, uh, the framework basically defines how different types of modules can interact with, with each other. So for example, here, based on the very specific uh, physics, uh, implementation uh, and scope of Jetscape. So for example, clearly the jet energy loss module needs to know uh, and has access to hydro information. In order to make this as uh, abstract and as safe, this is implemented in what it's called a signal slot paradigm. Uh, and if you're curious about this, uh, it, it, it was introduced uh, by the QT framework um, early on, and it's basically um, uh, it's it, it's basically a safer version of a callback, which avoids you to have uh, to pass raw pointers around, which always uh, can lead to to memory issues or other issues. So it's basically a safer version of uh, what in in, in C. And C++ is uh, called the callback version uh, function. So, and we have different uh, 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 signal slots which provide different informations, and all of them are uh, managed and can be uh, checked and uh, 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 also potentially modified as necessary in what is called the Jetscape Signal Manager instance. Uh, and if uh, you want to have a little bit more of a, a discussion on what uh, what uh, 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 basically data types get exchanged and uh, between the different modules, then I refer you to our uh, Jetscape manual, which you can find in the archive. Uh, and I'm pretty sure yeah. that you will encounter this also in uh, <clears throat> the hands-on session, but it's relatively obvious that clearly the jet energy loss module needs information to hydro. Uh, the hadronization manager to get hadrons has to access to all the partons. Uh, and then for example, the smash afterburner has to, uh, has to have access to all the hadrons and the um, uh, hard process has to have information about the position and so on of the initial state and so on. So these are all predefined. Uh, they can be extended, but uh, uh, we think that for the physics scope of Jetscape, this is the safest use and should provide you with all the information necessary. So just very briefly to, 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 to visualize uh, what would happen uh, in the different phases, uh, so, for example, here you would run Jetscape. You have um, an XML which provides an initial state, a hydro parton gun, and some meta and martini and colorless hadronization. So, you provide this in your XML file uh, and you will run Jetscape, and then it will go through the uh, four stages of the lifetime of any task. So it will go through the init phase, which only happens once uh, at the beginning. So at the at this time, you know, all the signal slot connections will be created uh, necessary between the different um, physics modules. The parameter will be read in, 
uh, of all of the modules and so on. And then you have the execute and the clear phase, which will be done in the Jetscape mode on a per event basis. Uh, and there basically you generate uh, your events um, and you create here recursive pattern shower uh, and for forward looking, uh, if people notice uh, this aspect of Jetscape, as I alluded before, so the part on shower evolution is basically the clock and sets the time in Jetscape. And this one in Xscape, we uh, expanded to be more uh, 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 generic, but uh, for the Jetscape physics, basically the part on shower uh, graph generation uh, is setting the clock. Uh, and this will then be uh, done per event. You have a clear, which recursively is called after each event. So if you have a module which allocates memory, uh, then you should free this up in order to avoid memory leaks. And then this get repeated for n events. And after that, you have the finish phase, which basically can be used to wrap up things in uh, particular if you want to write out uh, some other informations. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Sorry, can I interrupt because there was a question specifically about this plot here, I think. Somebody is uh, asking, what's the meaning of the double arrow red lines? There's uh, an arrow on both sides. Yes, sort of. um, the, the double arrow in principle means that uh, uh, you could, uh, uh, you can get information from Hydro, but you can also from meta, for example, uh, if you want to deposit some energy in terms of a liquid liquefier, which we have implemented, you can also give this information to the hydro itself. So it's a two-way communication between modules. Thank you. Okay, so very briefly, what what are the, the data, the main data structures of Jetscape and Xscape uh, uh, is the base class for all of the, is Jetscape particles. And as a choice, we used here to privately inherit from FastJet PseudoJet, uh, which makes it very easy and convenient to uh, scope uh, our output into uh, PseudoJets, and then you can easily put it and run it through FastJet. So we have a particle identification rest mass. Uh, in addition to what uh, FastJet PseudoJet provides, we also have a location in the four vector. We have some extra label and statuses. Uh, and from this uh, base class, which is based on the Jetscape particle base, which is uh, inherited from PseudoJet, uh, we derive patterns and hadrons. Uh, and in addition, we also have a photon class, which inherits from parton and potential uh, other classes uh, if we extend to, to, to uh, for example, Ws and Zs and so on. So the idea is here to, to, to use this uh, as uh, a starting point. So we also have something which is uh, uh, not uh, common in, in uh, the current event generators, even if you think about uh, uh, to some extent Kutia and Herwig, they all provide something like uh, the parton shower in a graph format, but however, you have to access it every time by asking for an ID of the uh, daughter or mother particles. Uh, so we provide uh, 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 an extra format, which is a graph template library, which is really using a, a computer science graph environment uh, with all the potential functionalities uh, uh, you can do on a graph. So you can use different graph algorithms, the connectivity and, uh, and so on. So it, to some extent, provides way more flexibility 
and we think it's uh, it's uh, from a computer science perspective it's uh, or also from a physics perspective uh, it's the natural representation of a parton shower as a real graph uh, where the partons are the edges um, and partons split at vertices and here you can see an example where you see uh, a simple one to two branching uh, <coughs> of a shower. And this is basically uh, a directed graph. And you could use in the graph template library, you could use different um, uh, graph traversing algorithms or queries uh, in order to do further manipulation. But most likely for them, uh, for most people, uh, here you see that we provide a function, for example, get final patterns for fast jet, uh, where only the uh, the uh, uh, patterns, final patterns, are defined by uh, not having a daughter, so everything where the arrow points uh, in the void. Uh, and with this, you can easily get the list or the vector of all of them, put them into fast jet, uh, and you can easily reconstruct your jets uh, on a platonic level. But it provides more uh, information, and I think it will be interesting to see in the future uh, if people uh, really think about clever ways of using more uh, graph-specific uh, algorithms to study jet energy loss in heavy ions. So I will pause here for a second. There was a question on Slack, which maybe you already answered in the chat, but uh, maybe you can also just uh, say it for everybody here. So there was a question, what is the liquefier? What does it do? Oh yeah, so the liquefier, and I'm pretty sure you will learn more about this when we uh, when there's the hands-on session and the, the the part of the school which is uh, uh, discussing jet energy loss. So liquefier basically means that you take uh, uh, an energy deposit from a, from a, a energy loss module and you convert it into a hydro source term. And this hydro source term then you can put in to the existing hydro uh, and then you let it evolve. So that's my understanding, but uh, mm -hmm. so more details uh, uh, you can ask uh, uh, in the in the proper part of the school. About Nothing else on Slack right now. Okay. Okay, so another thing you can do with the graph and also coming back to the question, do you have access to all the... Uh, uh, information of the hydro evolution in Jetscape, and yes, you can, uh, and you can make a little movie out of it. Uh, so where you see here, the the dots are partons from a, a hard process, and then at some point you have the hydro evolving, uh, and from a higher temperature to a lower temperature, uh, here for fifteen minutes. Uh, and then basically all of these are the final state partons and at some point they will be hadronized, which uh, is not yet in the movie. Uh, but basically all every pixel here, uh, you can see a little bit is, uh, uh, is what it's called a hydrocell. Uh, and uh, you can get the temperature information and entropy and everything else. So if you write your own module, then you definitely have this you don't have it uh, by default in an output format. Okay, so this is now very briefly uh, contributing modules, and this will be coming in the in the more in the hands-on session. So if you want to to contribute uh, contribute your own physics modules, in particular, if you want to stick to the uh, Jetscape mode, so to speak. Uh, then the framework connects those modules together. So to contribute models, you just need to interface to Jetscape. So we are providing for all of the modules you saw before in the flowchart, we provide base classes you would inherit from them. So for example, if you want to write an initial state module, you have to inherit from initial state, base class, and so on and so on. 
And then you have to implement the appropriate standard functions. So in a task, execute task, finish task, clear cast. And uh, you can use the appropriate signal slot uh, connections to interact with other modules. Uh, and in order to see how this is done, I will refer to the hands-on session, or you can look at the code in existing modules. Uh, so as an example here, we can uh, briefly outline what you would have to do with the jet energy loss module. Uh, however, I want to note that the jet energy modules and tasks are special in a sense uh, that the do energy loss function you have to provide uh, is called by the framework per parton, whereas most modules are called on a per event uh, basis with X, with exec or execute task, exec task. So this is uh, to highlight the, the special role here of the jet energy and the parton shower evolution in the Jetscape uh, setup. In any case, so you must, uh, your code must be a subclass of the jet energy loss modules. You have to override the init method, so the init task for initialization. And the actual user code must override the do energy loss method. This is where the actual energy loss calculation happen. And we decided that it really just means that you have to provide the physics to have an N by M uh, energy loss implementation on a partonic level, uh, and you don't have to worry about the recursiveness of the parton shower evolution from the one initiating parton. This is all done by the framework itself, so you really only have to answer the question, what happens in my physics to one or n partons coming in, and how many go out, and what happened to them? but you will discuss this more in the hands-on session. So for this, uh, we also I want to briefly point out that we provide for the XML part of, uh, we provide a singleton class, which provides you to allow easy access to all the module parameters from the XML files. It's called Jetscape XML. You can call it and you can ask for example, get element in double format or get element in text, get element in integer and so on. And you basically provide the uh, 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 broad uh, uh, module class, so energy loss, e-loss or initial state, uh, the name of your module here in that case, Martini, uh, and what parameter uh, you want to get the information in a double format X, and you can do this uh, for all different uh, possibilities and things you can store in an XML. So an optional second argument in these functions allow the parameter to be optional in the XML file. So by default, a parameter is required to be present or else the program will crash when it's not found. So that's the only thing you have to take into account. Okay, and with this I will briefly stop here and see if there are questions. Nothing in Slack. Okay. So yeah, all of these things will hopefully become more obvious when you do your hands on and really try to, to utilize them. Okay, so this is basically the Jetscape uh, way of doing business. Uh, now let's briefly switch to what is the extension and the different ways uh, uh, we, we, we opened up basically the, the relatively safe and clean implementation to some extent of Jetscape to allow more flexibility and to allow more, more physics to be represented while still having all the advantages of um, task-based framework and all the development of Jetscape. So for now in Xscape, you cannot steer Xscape functionalities or new additions via an XML file. You have to use one of the uh, explicit separate executables. You have to look at the documentation for this. Uh, we will have some, XML steering of Xscape uh, in one of the upcoming releases, 
However, you will see that due to the opening up of data formats and exchange, um, a little bit more thought has to go into because due to this opening up, it's not necessarily ensured that every module implementation will work with every other module uh, as it is in Jetscape if you use uh, only the Jetscape data formats and the signal slots. So we will evaluate this, but certainly in one of the future uh, releases, we will try to definitely improve the uh, XML steering of the Xscape functionalities. So very briefly, so the Xscape framework goal is to provide a decentralized and synchronized framework, which will allow any user to attach his or her own modules and reorganize the flow of data between the modules with the extended physics goal of Xscape to simulate the small systems, PA collisions at, and, and also PP collisions at arbitrary multiplicity. Uh, sorry. So this is uh, already achieved in the Xscape 1.0 release. Uh, any aspect of gold-gold collisions from fair to top LHC energies. So in particular there, uh, we will discuss the low beam energy aspect of it that uh, you have, for example, uh, hydro and uh, hadron, uh, hadron uh, cascades might live uh, simultaneously and how they interact and so on. So this is uh, uh, not an issue for uh, the top uh, top energies. Uh, and later on also to, to study uh, E plus, E minus, and EA collisions, uh, which is what I will not discuss today. Uh, so today uh, I want to introduce the uh, already existing extension, which is the uh, small systems in Xscape 1.0 which is the left-hand side. It's a reorganization and addition of uh, uh, how we treat the initial state shower. And on the right-hand side, you see uh, how we think about uh, introducing a new manager class, uh, bulk dynamic managers, to allow uh, execution, uh, concurrent execution and uh, uh, exchange of information between arbitrary uh, QCD media, so hydro and uh, hadrons uh, cascade, for example. So I will highlight these two things uh, and outline a little bit uh, what additional functionalities were needed in order to uh, achieve or hopefully will achieve uh, these functionalities. So the first thing is the small system, and this is what you can already download. So we provide a, a new ISR manager, which is uh, inherited and similar to the jet energy loss manager, which is basically using the jet energy loss evolution uh, in a medium. But this uh, initial state manager, which is uh, a subtask uh, of the hard process and the initial state itself, uh, evolves backwards in time. So therefore you can simulate the initial state radiation and it allows you to exchange and interact with the initial state module, for example, 3D Glauber, uh, if you want to remove or add energy, uh, depending on you, how you uh, simulate your, your uh, initial state radiation. Uh, so I want to have one remark here. So for now, uh, the uh, uh, ISR manager and the backward evolution the time in uh, backward evolution in time is uh, utilized for simplicity on a per event basis. Um, it's not yet uh, using the clock and for timestamp evolution, which I will discuss later. Uh, it's implemented, but it's not utilized as a default because at this moment in time, it is still basically all happening before we do the next step uh, toward the forward evolution. So for simplicity, uh, we do basically this in a in a Jetscape mode where the execution of modules will happen on a per event basis. However, here, uh, which was shown in, in hard props 2023, so with the iMeta implementation and this new ISR manager, 
uh, you see that you basically uh, you remove energy uh, from the nucleons if you have uh, hard scattering and this is not available for the hydro evolution and then you see that you have a reduced multiplicity in the presence of a high PT jet uh, and I'm pretty sure you will discuss uh, the physics behind uh, in more detail later in this class. Um, and I will pause here, but I just wanted to briefly outline that indeed this is a, basically a one-to-one -one mirroring of the energy loss aspect, which by its nature is forward time evolution. And we just used the infrastructure to relatively uh, quickly integrate a backward uh, evolution, which uh, uh, can create an initial state radiation. Okay, with this, I will pause for a second and see if there are questions. Nothing on Slack right now. Uh, Jorn, uh, if we can, uh, I think around like five minutes, if we can have uh, a break. Uh, that's sort of the time that we can sort of uh, wrap up the first lecture, if that's convenient. Sorry? Uh, around five minutes of time. Okay. Uh, yeah. O okay, I'll-, I'll, I'll So it's I'll, gonna be at 10, 15 the break, yeah. Okay, I'll try to wrap up things. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, so now I will briefly uh, ex uh, uh, discuss two aspects which were necessary to uh, to open up our our framework and uh, uh, allow a more flexible uh, exchange uh, of information and also concurrent execution. And the first is that we allow and implement a simplified and more flexible data exchange between all modules. Uh, so we achieve this by um, basically using a database approach. So we implemented a query history instant, which uh, uses a new C++ 7 data type any, uh, where you can basically uh, ask uh, uh, this this instance to get uh, uh, particular information from uh, any module. And the only thing we added is that every Jetscape module now has a function you can override, which is called get history. And in this implement get history in any Jetscape modules, you can hold in any data type. And in particular at this moment in time, you can use uh, easily non-framework data types, which was uh, not permitted uh, and envisioned in the Jetscape. So there's a caveat. So since this any data type has to be explicitly uh, casted at runtime into an existing uh, uh, data type, we are kind of breaking the stringent API uh, and only framework data type of approach uh, of Jetscape, which means every module works with every other module uh, in order to add this flexibility. Uh, so we might change this in the future by using a more safer version, uh, which is called a, a variant, or uh, if this functionality is not really necessary, uh, then it might be defunct. But at this moment in time, it's a very flexible, easy way to basically implement whatever information you need from every, from any uh, 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 module in any conceivable data type. So how would you do this? So our query history uh, basically instance uh, queries all the tasks which are uh, existing in the framework via a string. Uh, and retrieves the information you provided and override in the get history of any of these uh, moments. And for example, to get uh, all the parton showers from uh, all the uh, energy loss tasks attached, here as an example, you can get all the energy loss histories by saying query history uh, and get the history from energy loss modules, uh, all of them. Uh, since there can be more than one shower initiating parton, uh, you can store this in a vector of any type. And this is a different way 
of uh, getting information, but you could also implement any other data type. So I will click quickly pause here if there are any questions. Nothing new on Slack. Okay. So then the next big change in Xscape is the explicit introduction of clocks. So as I want to remember that the basically in Jetscape, you don't see any clock uh, because it's intrinsically driven by the parton shower evolution. But here we allow uh, a main clock, which can be in any um, time frame you want, but there can only be one main clock. And you can attach to each physics module your own module clock. So they are not really independent clocks, but rather you provide the transformation with respect to the main clock time frame. So this ensures that they are also always synced, right? Uh, instead of having an independent clock, you provide the transformation from the main clock frame. Uh, so if a main clock is attached to the main task, then the physics modules can be executed, uh, even if you don't provide a module clock, but you, uh, by default, it use the main clock time frame on a pair time step basis. So meaning that rather than the Jetscape per event execution, you will execute it per time step as given by the main clock or the transformation you provide by the, uh, by the uh, uh, module clock transformation, but you can still mix uh, per event or per time step uh, execution if it makes sense from a physics perspective. So in order to allow this explicitly, you have to set time step to true. It's the default is false. So the default is a per event Jetscape-like execution. So in order to achieve this, uh, the Jetscape module base in uh, inherited from a new base class time module, which allows you to add uh, uh, clocks to the Jetscape framework. In particular, it allows you to add a main clock and uh, add a module clock. You can set the time ranges. For example, you can say that, well, no matter what, uh, my physics implementation of my uh, uh, of my module is only valid in that particular time range, and then the framework will uh, ignore uh, your module if it's not in the allowed time range. Uh, and then you can set explicitly for time step true, and then you would really do the uh, per time step execution. So what the advantage of having this, so the Jetscape module base provides now an additional per time step workflow and it's two folded. In the first stage in the calculate time phase, all modules simulate the next time step. So there's no communication intended in this, uh, uh, in this phase. So it can be trivially multi-threaded if needed. So this allows us very easily to have each module run in its own thread if you have or GPU, whatever you want. Uh, and when all of these modules are done, executing and calculating the next time step, we have the exit time phase where you have communication, data exchange, and so on between all modules needed to prepare and modify conditions for the next time step. So, uh, just as a quick remark, if you want to develop modules which can be executed per time step, you have to provide these functions on the left-hand side, calculate time task and so on, analog to the inner task, exit task in the Jetscape workflow. Once you have this implemented, then your module get executed automatically uh, per time step as given by the main clock uh, or any transformation of the uh, clock uh, in your module. Okay, so, and this is basically needed. And so this is basically my last slide. 
for Xscape 2.0, where we want to have a low energy gold gold uh, uh, heavy ion collision. So in particular, we utilize and want to utilize this functionality in a new bulk dynamic managers, which organizes and allows concurrent running of multiple QCD bulk media implementation on a per time step basis and exchange information and so on. So this is really uh, utilizing all the extension of Xscape. Uh, so initially for Xscape 2.0, the hopefully uh, releases and end of the year, the first step would be to have uh, 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 hydro music implemented and the Hadron Cascade Smash uh, with the focus on low beam energy, heavy ion collisions, and really have a concurrent and simultaneous evolution of uh, 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 hydro and uh, Hadron Cascade and their interaction in time and space. So first proof of principle implementation of this new functionalities and the other functionalities are outlined uh, can be found in the test programs uh, in the custom example directory of your GitHub. If you're curious about uh, how we envision this, uh, the physics uh, is still in development and will be probably then presented uh, uh, by the end of the year and next year. Okay, so in summary, uh, Jetscape is uh, 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 and Xscape uh, is a framework for general purpose uh, collisions, event generators. So really envision from electron ion to gold gold collisions in a uh, 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 in the same environment with the same framework to uh, really allow modular. Uh, exchange uh, in a in a in an organized uh, uh, fashion. Uh, so, and the idea is really behind that you only have to implement the physics and the module you are interested, and in, you can utilize everything else, uh, and it will basically run out of the box. So, please contribute your own modules. It's also a tool for the community, so it will really enable well-controlled event generator comparisons. Uh, so, for example, you know, it's easy to compare different energy loss uh, approaches uh, in Jetscape because you don't have to worry about the initial state hadronization and all of this. This will stay the same if you use the same XML. Uh, so this is really, I think, very important to, to isolate and highlight uh, the differences of physics. And it should be really uh, a test bed for theoretical and experimental development. So Jetscape in particular has been successfully used and tested in large scale simulation efforts. Uh, and there is uh, on the next slide, there are some uh, thoughts uh, and, and, and lessons from this, uh, but I think I'm running out of time. And uh, if you are interested in that aspect, uh, then you can have a look at the uh, at the slide later and ask questions. Okay, with this, I will uh, pause and finish my talk. Excellent. Uh, so any questions for Jorn? Uh, feel free to have this on the Slack channel. Is there any, there's a couple of questions there, right? Yeah, so there is uh, one question that probably has already been answered, but uh, maybe I'll just ask if Jörn wants to add. Uh, somebody asks, what is sort of the energy range that Xscape 2.0 can cover in the end uh, when everything is said and done in terms of square root S? And uh, Tuna has already answered basically from Hades to LHC. Um, is there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I mean, from a from a framework perspective, it can handle everything. It depends on what physics is implemented. But to some extent, yes. I, uh, I guess with the modules that are around, right, at that. Oh, with the, with yeah. the modules which are around. Of course, you can always add something for, I don't know, <laughs> MEV collisions, right? But I, I, I guess the question is, like, with, if you download it, you run it, what, what is possible? So, so I think that the initial idea was to have the big beam energy scan cover, covered which I think definitely from 
7G V up to LHC energies. Uh, not entirely sure if we really have the fixed target aspect of it. That it's a little bit beyond, uh, I think, my knowledge, but definitely everything which is uh, done in the beam energy scan and collider mode, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hopefully that answers that question. There was uh, another question, um, follow up to the liquefier. So the question is just to clarify, so energy loss calculated, for example, by Meta Martini is provided to hydro via liquefier for each time step. So that, that's sort of the question. Uh, so is that really what, what happens? Um, yes, as, as so, far as I know, yes. If, if the user wishes to choose that setup, right? So yes, you yes. don't have to use the liquefier. Maybe we no, should also don't. add that. You don't, it's, it's, it's optional. Yeah. So also if you use the, 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 the liquefier, you basically have to rerun hydro again, right? If you really want to have that evolution. So it adds significantly more running time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is there, but it's optional. Yeah. And and by the way, for everybody who has posted on, on Slack, if I, you know, if there's an aspect to your question I don't read correctly, please uh, just feel free to, to speak up. Um, there was another question, basically, if you could follow up on the clock a little bit uh, more, because it, it went by a little bit fast. Um, so it's a new feature in, in XK, but why do we need it and what is its physical significance? Well, the, the, the significance of the, of the clock is that, uh, if you think back in Jetscape, you basically had to have a part on shower evolution, uh, which acted as a clock, right? Uh, so this is not necessarily anymore. So you can, uh, for uh, low beam energies, you can basically completely ignore any jet evolution. However, if you ignore it, then the original Jetscape uh, framework didn't have any, any time, any concept of time, right? And in order to have this, uh, we introduced a main clock where you can explicitly say this is, the time range and the time steps and all modules you attach to it basically will pick up and provide information as a time step. So to some extent, it's the more, to some extent, it's the more natural way of how you would think about a Monte Carlo. You just give a, give a clock and say every, every module has to provide information and then we exchange and put it together. Uh, but for the specific physics case of Jetscape, we had a natural module which acted as a clock. Also without a clock and time step, it's basically impossible to synchronize, right? So you cannot really run concurrently and make sure that at any given time, all the information you need uh, from all modules are at hand. So you have to have something setting setting the time and the range of time you want to move forward right so if you in particular if you want to run two different modules in parallel they they somehow you you need a clock to synchronize yeah. it right yes okay i hope that answered the question anything else in uh in slack i don't see anything actually there will be a, a big question and answer session after, like at the end of today's uh, session, correct? So um, if you have follow-up questions to your talk, um, maybe you can still ask them then. I was typing a question in the, but then yeah, maybe if they want to quickly ask it. Go ahead. Ah, okay, so the question arrived. So um, the clock measures the time that the code takes to run or is it the physical time of the system? So it is the physical time of the system, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so uh, it's it's really supposed to be the time in the in the lab frame, I suppose, that is ticking by. Well, right. you can define what frame you want to use. Yeah. So, but yes, so it's the... 
it's the uh, uh, collision evolution time, not the computing time. Sounds good. Well, I think uh, just for the sake of time, let's maybe have our break uh, now. Um, and uh, we can break for, I think, around, uh, if time allows, maybe 15 minutes, so we can be back at around 10.45 for the next talk. Right, sounds good. All right, sounds good. So I'll see you all uh, at 10.45 for the next talk. In the meanwhile, uh, the slides obviously are available, and if you have any questions, keep uh, filling the Slack, please. Thanks. As of the of the Monte Carlo uh, methods for parking energy loss, and the idea was is to more or less try to give us a general overview of what are the ingredients ne needed for Monte Carlos to address these, uh, these effects of uh, part and energy loss in, in heavy ions. Of course, during this week, you will uh, learn much more in detail uh, in, with respect to Jetscape or in the Xscape framework. But uh, in this talk, I'll try to be a little bit more general so that you can have a more uh, broader picture. So the outline is uh, basically to address if you want three main questions. First of all, what is a Monte Carlo event generator? And of course, on this part, we will focus more on the part and shower module that is responsible for afterwards for the energy loss processes in, in heavy ions. Then focusing more on heavy ions, I will try to give you more or less an overview of what are the immediate effects that you can have. Uh, and then some examples exactly of what can we do with the Monte Carlo model for, for jet quenching and how, why is it so useful? So first, what is a Monte Carlo event generator? Well, our physics, in uh, it's the, as detected by quantum mechanics, says that everything can happen. It's just given uh, in a function of the probabilities of uh, part and distribution uh, probabilities or uh, probability issues and densities. So this means that everything can happen, but more or less frequently. So, and this is where Monte Carlo event generators come in. So Monte Carlos have implicitly random numbers that try actually to mimic these quantum mechanical choices that we see. Uh, the, the part of the event generator actually is very useful because it allows to trace the evolution of the event structure and have access to what we call as Monte Carlo truth. In fact, uh, you already heard of this during your talk. And so if you want, these are the tools that allow us to directly connect what we have, let's say at the most fundamental level from uh, in this case, quantum mechanics or quantum uh, uh, QCD to actually final state events in which you have all the result of the hadronic event. So the problem is that, okay, high energy collision, now we focus on, let's say a proton-proton collision is actually a very complex process. And how can we actually describe everything that comes in in this picture that we have here? And Everything that the Monte Carlo sets based on is actually on the principle of factorization. We just try to compute these in smaller pieces and small problems that afterwards we can try to uh, interconnect. And for instance, we can uh, think first on the hard scattering, which is just the, the elementary uh, partonic process that happens when we collide to protons, for instance. Of course, these partons will uh, eventually shower uh, and this includes initial state shower and final state shower, so the radiation before and after the hard scattering. Of course, then we have we have multiple uh, parton interactions, beam remnants, and finally the hadronization. And so the general, let's say, uh, structure of a Monte Carlo event generator, a proton proton Monte Carlo event generator, is all these processes. And if you look at the momentum or the energy scale between them, we see that there is a very clear separation of scales between all these kind of processes. Now, of course, in this talk, we want to focus more on final state showers. I will include here also initial state because basically the, technolo the techn technology for each one of these is kind of similar, but basically these are two approaches. So the way we generate higher um, uh, further radiation out of the 
uh, patterns that come out of the hard matrix element is, for instance, to compute these uh, at next to leading order, next to next to leading order, et cetera, et cetera. So this is very accurate process, but of course it's limited to a very few particles. And this is where pattern showers that can actually uh, come into uh, uh, help because they are, although they are uh, less accurate than the matrix elements, the full matrix element calculations, at least they allow us to cast the evolution of a parton system from a given scale, let's say Q0, to a lower scale Qn. And this is done by through some evolution equations that are based on the splitting function probability. So if you recall, for instance, your quantum field theory or QCD course on uh, during university, you might have uh, seen this. Uh, and basically, this is the building block of the subsequent parts and showers. Now, how exactly we uh, introduce this in some Monte, in some uh, in some Monte Carlo? Well, for the Monte Carlo part, we need to select, to make a, some sort of selection out of a probability distribution function. And for instance, we start with a given parton at a given, let's say, scale. It can be a virtuality, it can be a mass, it can be, uh, or it can be some angle. Uh, so some just some scale that you that you have for your parton. And then, of course, that okay from uh, computing, for instance, the single gluon emission spectrum, you can uh, understand that your addition spectrum has now afterwards two divergences. Uh, and then there is some process in which you basically resum all these possible emissions and you build this kind of Sudakov, of Sudakov form factor, which is basically the building block of the parton showers. And actually, it doesn't give you the probability of emitting. It's, it's actually give you the probability of not emitting between two scales, t0 and t. And this is exactly the, our probability distribution function that enters in the Monte Carlo. So say if we want to have, a, 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 let's say, a parton that will somehow uh, fragment or emit some other particle, the probability of not decaying between these two scales is given by the Sudakov form factor. So we simply give a random. We dice some some random number the, 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 from a uniform distribution, and we ask exactly what is the T1 scale, for instance, that actually corresponds to this random number out of your Sudakov. And once you get the scale, you say that at this scale, then the particle decays, or in this case, emits. And I say decay because now you can basically iterate this process all along. And if you look more closely to the Sudakov for factor, it's just a more complicated version of what would be a radioactive decay that for us is much more similar, in which the survival probability now is directly the splitting function. And so this allows us basically to have, uh, uh, in a very simplistic way, uh, a probabilistic picture of the parts and showers in which we simply dice random numbers. And from there, we simply retrieve the scales and the kinematics of the subsequent emissions, and we build the whole history of your part and shower until, of course, some lower momentum scale, that is when perturbative QCD is no longer applied, and you have to go to your next building block, which is the hadronization. The only thing that I didn't mention here is, of course, that you have some constraints on the, how the scale evolves through this, uh, through all this process. That is, you have to respect more or less angular ordering because this is something, something that we know from uh, collinear and soft limit of QCD. And so you have this restriction, but in addition to that, basically you can sample all your part and showers, uh, all your uh, part and emissions and build your part and shower enter hydronization, and afterwards you get what we call jets in some important events, of course, without taking into account all the contamination from the rest of the events. And now let's move to heavy ions. So any question so far? So I assume that there isn't. Um, yeah, there's nothing on Slack right now. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, and so we move now for heavy ions. So in heavy ion, of course, the people from heavy ion also be always picture proton-proton collisions in a very simplistic way. So usually we think of this kind of process. And then afterwards, when we collide uh, in, the, in the case of uh, a light-light nuclear, nuclear uh, collision or uh, 
uh, uh, a heavy ion, uh, heavy ion collision, we think of having this process now immerse on top of a quark on plasma. And of course, that all the driving now questions that we have, that is how exactly is this uh, fluid be uh, thermalized, how does it evolve, how it emerged, et cetera, et cetera, are deeply connected to the questions of how exactly are our jets, so our part and shower, affected by the presence of this, of this, uh, of this medium. And this is, of course, what we call jet quenching. Now, uh, I saw in the upper room that you will have plenty of talks uh, uh, related to heart growth. So we'll have flavor, coconut jets. You also have some uh, uh, part and energy loss dedicated lecture uh, during this week. So I will not go much into the details of these parts. And so now focusing on the picture that we looked before, exactly what we need to worry about now that we, we want to move these uh, uh, to move this uh, picture of a jet in a Monte Carlo that is dedicated for heavy ions. Well, first of all, because we have scatterings with the particle or with this fluid, we will have some sort of medium induced energy loss, which is simply says that we'll have extra radiation with respect to our vacuum baseline. Of course, we can have more uh, collisional energy loss, so scatterings uh, due to, to with the particle with the medium constituents. These uh, particles can further rescatter and eventually also give rise to a kind of correlated uh, medium wake with your jet. This is what we call the medium recoils. And all of this on top of a medium that it's evolving. And you also heard of it during Jorn's talk okay, as well. And there are also the possibility to explore, for instance, medium's effects on the hydronization, although most of the models actually assume that hydronization is not modified because it already happens at the time scale in which the medium is no longer uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, being uh, active, let's say. So you will have this dedicated talk on Friday to talk about exactly this medium-induced energy loss. So I'm, what I'm trying to do now is actually to build, to look more care carefully on the building blocks for you to understand how this goes into the Monte Carlo event generators. So if we move to the medium-induced radiation, let's say we did a perturbative QCD uh, perspective, this is more or less the building block that we, uh, started by talking about, which is the gluon Bramstrom, which, okay, help us to build actually the Sudakov or proton-proton uh, collisions. But the process now in medium is something that goes more or less along this line. So we have some sort of uh, medium emission as well, but now all the particles can go some sort of scattering with the medium. And uh, for uh, completeness, I put here is usually the light cone variables because okay, we work in the high energy limit. It means that the minus component of this particle, if my particle goes in the longitudinal direction, uh, the minus component is almost uh, is basically zero, and we only work with the light cone coordinate, uh, the plus coordinate, and then the transverse coordinates are the uh, coordinates of interest for our problem. So. With these kind of diagrams, now we, what we need is somehow to build, to build some sort of Feynman rules uh, to translate our vacuum QCD uh, Feynman rules into some sort of in-medium QCD Feynman rules. And one of these objects, for instance, is the Wilson line, uh, which basically is the first approximation to this kind of, uh, of, uh, of processes. And what we assume is that, okay, instead of, you, instead of having just the propagator of my quark line, I have some sort of scatterings with the medium, but the scatterings only change actually the color of my particles. So they don't do anything else. They just apply some sort of color rotation of my, of my color field here. And this is what you see here. So in this kind of propagators, we need to emit, uh, make explicit the limits, the longitudinal limits of our, our medium, or the, let's say the medium part that the, the quark is traversing. The transverse coordinate that in this case is kept basically the same, unchanged. And then as you can see here is just the product of the interactions between the color fields of my medium that are some uh, in some sort of pot ordered uh, uh, line along the, the quark direction. 
And this is basically the, the interpretation that we give to this, to this Wilson line. Of course, we can be a little bit more refined in these calculations and assume, for instance, some sort of transverse momentum kick for each interaction. And so in addition to my Wilson line, I will then receive some sort of a kick uh, in the transverse direction that would, will result in some kinetic energy that you have here. And again, I have basically to integrate over all possible trajectories that my particle can undergo from this point to this point. Okay, and this is what we call the green functions. So all the details don't uh, now don't uh, don't worry so much. I guess you will see this much more with much more detail afterwards. And you can, of course, uh, this is one way of looking to the problem. You can look to the problem in the multiple ways. But the point is, okay, now that I have my green functions, what do I do with them? Uh, now we can compute exactly the medium induced Coulomb radiation to kind of build or try to build some sort of Sudakov or medium modified Sudakov for my Barton shower. And this is exactly what we see here. So now I have exactly the gluon Bremsstrahlung, strahlung, but in which my particles now are described not with the vacuum Feynman rules, but with this medium, let's say, uh, Feynman rules. And with that, okay, we can just basically uh, calculate this stuff and we can ask ourselves for instance what is the radiation spectrum of my emitted gluon and we usually end up with expressions like this which okay a part of this uh, uh, apparent complication what you see here is basically this part here that is the emission kernel that corresponds to the average of the, so this is the amplitude, this is the the, uh, the transconjugate uh, amplitude. So as you know, for the calculating the cross section, we need to average uh, to, to have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of diagrams. And so this is the emission kernel that corresponds basically to the time, uh, to the, let's say to the Brownian motion or to the dynamics of my system that accounts for the time in which my gluon is being emitted from my quark. So they are not exactly two independent sources, but rather a coherent system. And then we have this part here that accounts for the classical broadening. Then this is basically the broadening of my gluon. And the important thing here is that all in all these cases, you will have some sort of scattering rate, which is the sigma, and this is where all your medium information goes into. So here, for instance, uh, I can use uh, some Yukawa potential to say that my scattering centers within the medium are simply uh, screen potentials, which uh, and the screening is detected by the Dubai mass. And so we can do some numerics and compute uh, the kind of the spectrum of this uh, medium, in medium induced radiation and see what it comes. So this is the medium induced radiation as a function of trans momentum or some scale trans momentum. And this is the fraction of energy or the inverse fraction of energy that is radiated by my gluon. And one thing that it can uh, be very apparent here is that now in vacuum, for instance, if you remember our, uh, our probability of emission has actually two divergence. One is that is collinear, the other that is uh, in the infrared. Now here, my spectrum actually is suppressed in this uh, lower transverse momentum region. And this comes, uh, this is the, the LPM effect. And this suppression actually is the thing that, okay, says that my vacuum, my medium shower is actually suppressed in this region with respect to vacuum. But this also puts some sort of technical challenge that is how exactly to resum a quantity that now is not divergent or doesn't have exactly the same kind of divergences, the same kind of double logarithmic divergence that we see in vacuum. So this poses some technical challenge actually to build some sort of Sudakov one factor that uh, allows to basically merge the same language of vacuum and medium relation on top of uh, on on the same object. Of course, that this is just part of one problem. The, un the other pro problem is medium response. So medium response, it's basically the QGP particles that become correlated with the jet. And uh, as seen from a QCD approach, so in Jetscape, for instance, you also have some uh, access to some uh, uh, strongly coupled approach to this kind of uh, phenomena. But in a PQCD perspective, what we see is scattering. So it's simply two, 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 two channels. 
uh, that whose again scattered, uh, scattering math matrix element we can compute, and this is, for instance, what is included in Joule, one of the Monte Carlos, and LBT. This is the, the things that you have to take into account as well. In which, okay, instead of having this kind of process, you account for a linear Boltzmann transport model to actually describe all these processes. Uh, but in all of them, we are all of this. Uh, uh, all of these of, of these processes are actually more close to some some small momentum transfer, so small momentum uh, and uh, low momentum energies, and this means that you are also very close to non perturbative regions where you might have also have two troubles to kind of control exactly all analytically all these effects. So this means that. Putting everything together, we have a jet that has some, let's say, vacuum-like part and shower because vacuum emissions continue to happen independently of whether they are inside or outside of the medium. But then we have some sort of semi-hard and soft medium-induced radiation that is basically uh, excited from the interactions with the medium. And then we have this soft, let's say, jet-induced medium response that also travels along your jet. And all of this on top of some space-time evolving structure that is your quark-mon plasma uh, model. So everything happens uh, at in which, so everything this is connected and happening across this evolving medium. And so this is not as easy in VP, and the question is how exactly we want to describe it. So you will face basically two kind of approaches or analytical approaches that are trying to use first principle calculations to address all this, uh, all this, uh, this, uh, this phenomena, and of course. You, we have been uh, seeing very, very, uh, this, this field has been very, very active. And so there has been a lot of improvements over all the, uh, all the limits that you can consider. But of course, we have limited understanding exactly on how to treat the lower momentum scales, because this is close to non-perturbative uh, QCD, which it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting problem, nonetheless very hard. Uh, and then we have this interplay between vacuum and medium induced showers that actually we still not uh, are not able to actually kind of have a very um, very solid description of this. On the other hand, we have the Monte Carlo approaches that actually try to consider the full jet shower evolution and evolving medium. Of course, that they need to rely on the analytical results that are that uh, are that I should just show, but because this goes into hand in hand, sometimes they are actually lacking most of the recent analytical developments, and the results are not as accurate as the analytical results itself. Uh, and of course, that the analytical analytical results, because they were derived in some kinematical regions of the phase space. Uh, Monte Carlos need to obey energy momentum conservation. And at the end of the day, you need to require, you need to have some uh, phenomenological extensions on top of your analytical, analytical results, and this requires further modeling. Of course, it, this is not exactly a disadvantage or an advantage, it's just the fact that we can explore actually to kind of push more, uh, more forward more uh, our knowledge of how to build exactly or how to deal with this. Uh, part and showers in the medium. So let's now move to the other question that is, what is a jet quenching Monte Carlo? So at this point, I stop and ask if there are any questions. Nothing in Slack right now. So let me encourage people to ask questions in Slack, please. Or speak up right now. If not, then I will yep. continue and probably some uh, question now can, can come out. Because now we are moving to exactly the things that you will work throughout this week. So Monte Carlo tried to look at the picture in a very broad sense in which we want to simulate the N-particle system. 
that is originated through the whole process, the whole collision. And this again includes all the vacuum radiation, all the medium effects, an evolving medium, hydronization, and takes. And this means that we want to include the medium modifications in all momentum scales and all the stages, let's say, of the evolution after the quark form plus is formed. Now, there are two different approaches because we have some limitations on exactly how to know uh, the parse and shower or how to build some sort of pseudocop form factor for the medium. We will still don't have the final answer. So for now, we can actually have two kinds of families to address this. One is to change exactly the jet evolution. So in my pictures, I usually put like this, let's say the part and shower and then some top on top of some evolving medium. And what this family of Monte Carlo's tried to do is actually they try to modify the splitting functions, the splitting rate that is the pseudocomp of pseudocomp form factor in some sort of way. And this means that they will include medium modifications throughout the part and shower and in all momentum scales that you have in your jet. This is the, the for instance, Joule matter that you will see during this week, that this is also included in Jetscape, Jupiter, et cetera. The other family is actually the family of uh, Monte Carlos that instead of having this kind of change in the part and shower, they try to, to have a more afterburner approach. Jörn also mentioned this, in which they try to preserve your part and shower that is hard and collinear. So I assume they are unmodified with respect to the to the to the to, to proton proton. And in this case, they basically take part of your part and shower. They can allow to evolve until hydronization and then apply energy loss. They can select a given scale in which they kind of cut the shower and then apply some uh, medium induced um, uh, or some medium induced effects on, in, in this. And in the, uh, of course that in this kind of model, so you will, Oh, you will hear, hear about, for instance, LBT. This is also the case of Martini for, uh, and uh, for the hybrid as well. And so in this case of models, this is what we call the afterburners. All the modifications are actually done on the developer or semi-developed part and shower. And this means that they will basically dominate the low momentum scales. Now, let me give you more of a concrete example on how exactly is this done. So if we want to change the jet evolution, I mentioned that you have the gluon perm strong, you have the spectrum, you have double logarithmic divergence that you can resum to build your Sudakov. On in the case of a medium induced radiation, you don't have one of the divergence because you have uh, some sort of uh, suppression that is zero by the LPM effect. But you can kind of have an SNS such that your splitting probability is modified as a correction to the vacuum shower. And this means technically that you what we do is to actually modify the splitting function from the vacuum to actually include this modification. And instead of having the Sudakov as just as the vacuum, you have some sort of modification of your splitting function. And this means that you treat this, let's say, finite pieces of your of your spectrum as corrections to your vacuum kernel. So this, for instance, would be an example on how to modify the jet evolution of your part and shower. The other strategy is driven by the fact that, okay, let's look now for time estimates on the processes that happened here. So we have the part and permission time, which is the time it takes for a part and actually to radiate something. So after this time, uh, you, instead of having one emitter, you will have two. In between, it will be a coherent state, and this is valid even in vacuum. And so we can try to estimate what is the formation time for this medium-induced radiation. So for the transfer momentum for medium-induced radiation is more or less of the order of you had times the permission time. So Q hat is actually some sort of, let's say density, average density of your medium. Uh, and so with this, you can, you, from here, you can basically check that, okay, for having medium induced emissions inside of my medium that are with a finite length, then this means that the formation times of all these, uh, these part and emissions have to go 
beyond or the, the formation time for these emissions are always below this number here. Now let's look for vacuum-like emissions. So vacuum-like emissions are typically have transit momentum much, much larger than this transit momentum acquired by multiple scatterings, okay? especially the first ones that have, as you know, are the widest angle. And this means that if now, if I translate this into from some formation time again, I have exactly this inequality that says the formation time of my vacuum emissions is actually much shorter than the formation time of my medium use emissions. So this means that my vacuum actually develop much faster than my, uh, my uh, sorry for the typo. So the vacuum emissions actually de develop much faster than my medium ones. And so if I have some, some part that now is radiating, it is natural that the dominant contributions for the first emissions are vacuum-like and the subsequent ones are medium-like. And so if I look for my shower, I now have some sort of idea in which I preserve my vacuum-like structures, and then I apply some medium-induced radiation on top of it. And this is exactly the, let's say, the concept behind these afterburners. So as you can see, it's not exactly one or over the other, uh, it's just a choice. And if you choose to make uh, some sort of change in jet evolution, you are choosing or actually developing further a given part and shower. While on the afterburners, you kind of stick to the idea in which you are not trying to make any changes to the, part, to the vacuum part and shower. Of course, they, this part here is easier to develop just because you can simply grab some other part and shower from uh, from uh, from proton proton collisions and apply, for instance, your uh, your your Monte Carlo model to this to this kind of of uh, on this kind of of uh, uh, strategies. So this is more or less uh, also how you would pick up. Uh, the, the medium induced effects. So on this side, usually we, we focus on the medium induced radiation spectrum just because we have access to the full kinematic range. In this case, you kind of use the transport equations because you can uh, uh, basically integrate over the, over the medium length. Uh, and uh, of course, that in all of them, you kind of enter it, uh, you're always restricted to the, to the kinematical restrictions of that particular uh, energy loss model. Uh, and so there's no actually correct answer, as I told you, is all of them are choices. And what I would highlight as the major, let's say, cautious in taking each one of or the other, exactly on this, you are always bounded to a given uh, choice that you make for your var uh, for, for your vacuum part and shower. While on this, mostly you need to be uh, careful exactly on how to deal with the momentum scales that are close to the non-perturbative region. But of course, that the, the, the cautions of each one of these approaches actually represent the major benefits of, on each one of them, because in this case, you're actually trying to understand better what how is the interplay between vacuum and medium showers. I mean, analytically, we cannot describe it, but that doesn't mean that we, not, we are not able to do some phonological studies on this to actually understand how to do it. And all the, on, on this side, I mean, QCD at low energies is also something that we need to deal with, and we can take exactly the advantage of having uh, heavy ion environments to actually push forward more this. And you, again, this week in Jetscape, you actually play with one of uh, each one of each uh, one of these two worlds because Jetscape has included not only matter for the high virtuality part of the shower. As you, LBT, Martini, or some other models that you will uh, uh, that you will um, work this week for the low virtuality part of the shower, so they uh, they have this modular approach, approach in which you factorize the problem. Liliana, would this be a good time for a question because we finally have a question on Slack? Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, somebody's asking: Do both parton shower models? Uh, successfully recreate quenching observables. So I guess, yes. you know, if you have only one or the other, can they do yes. that? So I would say, and uh, I mean, there's plenty of people here exactly from Jetscape. I would say that at the moment, more or less all of them can qualitatively reproduce the datum 
but all of them has also challenges to actually consistently describe all jet observables. So for instance, if you look for some observables that are more sensitive to energy loss, then actually most of the, of the Monte Carlos either on one side or the other uh, can actually produce more or less the data. The problem is when we go into the details of the jet substructure, then yeah, different differences will start to appear. I will actually show in some of the some of the examples uh, on the last part of the of the talk. Does this uh, answer to your question? Yeah, it does. It answer the question. Okay. So and, this uh, is, let me. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, please. <laughs> Oh, I just wanted to uh, sort of from a Jetscape perspective, maybe add, if I may, that uh, so in Jetscape, you could run um, sort of both at the same time, not exactly at the same time uh, in terms of a physical clock, but sort of um, after, you know, one after each other for, for partons. Exactly. So exactly. you can combine them in principle. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So until Jetscape, actually, this was not possible. Only with Jetscape was what we kind of started or at least to my knowledge started to actually to include all this uh, in a more uh, let's say uh, in in the same bulk so the other thing that we need to actually uh, address is elastic energy loss and again here uh, you kind of need to have some sort of scattering centers to which you will scatter your parton shower or your partons from your parton shower. These actually can be sampled from some hydro profile if you have some hydrodynamic simulations, which again in JavaScript you do, or some if you are working with some more simplistic model, you can perhaps work with some sort of one dimensional European evolution model. And in that case, you can simply again scatter or sample the density of scattering centers from this particular time uh, evolution of your temperature. And then again, you can simply connect your parton shower and check whether or not there is a scattering center with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, 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 elastic uh, interaction with these scattering centers and then apply your uh, energy loss model for uh, to account for uh, this elastic energy loss. If your running hydro, then you can do one step further, that is to consider exactly your jet as the source term of your uh, hydro, uh, hydrodynamic background, and can, you can have some sort of coupled jet hydro evolution. Uh, this is uh, something that, of course, it's uh, more computational challenging, but nonetheless, it's, it's possible. And in this case, what you'll see uh, usually these models what we will yield is some sort of so the picture that you can have is some sort so this is something that I actually take it take it from uh, uh, the hybrid model in which you see the jet as some sort of perturbation on top of your fluids and actually you you this uh, the, the effect that you have is some sort of drag in which you have this kind of uh, ripples in your model. And then these ripples, these perturbations, these positive perturbations can be actually now uh, be uh, uh, transcripted, let's say, uh, into particles uh, using some sort, sort, of, sort of Cooper Fry or something to account exactly for this extra radiation as medium response in as part of your chat as well. Uh, for the medium evolution, of course, you can, as I mentioned, okay, Bjorken is the most simplistic version that you can uh, that you can think for your quark and plasma. But of course, that nowadays people are uh, more and more migrating towards more uh, accurate machinery that is event by event non ideal hydrodynamics. I mean, you have initial conditions, you have some sort of um, uh, hydrodynamic description with different uh, equation of state parameters, and you can exactly play with these kind of different initial conditions, different hydrodynamic models to actually include in your, again, in your time, in your Monte Carlo. This is something, again, that is, I guess, it's possible also for Jetscape to actually include different kind of initial conditions, for instance, or different kind of equation of states for your hydrodynamic uh, medium evolution with the same, let's say, part and shower kind of topology that you want. 
on this, you will hear also more uh, on Wednesday. So as for when to start actually to make some sort of dialogue between your part and shower and your, uh, and your medium is actually another source of uncertainty because the picture again that I usually put here in which you have the heart scattering, you have the medium uh, produced exactly at this time of the, of the event is not exactly the thing that apparently is what we get from data comparison. So when we look for the for the sketch of your uh, heavy ion collision evolution, what happens is that the formation of the quartz pollen plasma is not instantaneous, and so usually this re this reflects into some initialization time for your hydro profile. But your part and shower starts to develop actually at time zero. Let's say if I use this clock uh, language that you that uh, that was mentioned before. So I have my collision, my clock starts, my part and shower starts, or at least my heart part and my heart part and is produced, but my hydro profile only enters in the game a little bit later. And we still don't know exactly how to model the jet interaction with the medium before this this time. And the, and the one of the difficulties is of course that in this kind of perturbative description, we require some static scattering rates uh, that are more uh, aligned with the hydrodynamic description. But before this QGP phase, it's more on the realm of uh, maybe color glass condescent or something in which we still don't know exactly how to couple this evolution uh, to my, our part and shower. So what we usually do is some sort of fine tune this down zero and make it su such that my part and shower does not lose any energy until this time zero. And then only after time zero is that when they start to interact with the medium. And of course, there are still much more pro problems or concerns that one should address when building some sort of part and shower or toy Monte Carlo for to address this part and shower, this uh, energy loss studies. Uh, one of them, for instance, is production point. So as you know, we have some nuclear uh, overlap that is not exactly, uh, it can be more central or more almond shape. And here again comes the problem of the time structure or the space-time structure of jets. In vacuum, a part and shower does not, is not, does not have any kind of physical realization of, uh, uh, of formation time or how, how much time it evolves because Everything is in momentum uh, coordinates, and what we see is just the end product of the of the part and shower. So the part and shower is just an idealization of Monte Carlo, and if you want uh, to be more accurate, it's actually some just some interpretation of of uh, of uh, Monte Carlo on how this process actually goes. But in the process of a medium, we still need to have this. Even for the models that do account, for instance, for some sort of afterburner in which they only use energy loss or they only apply energy loss to the latest part of your jet, you still need to take into account where the jet was produced and what part of the jet actually traveled through the part and shower. And one of these, uh, for, to account actually, actually for this, we usually uh, make use of the part information time. So as you, I told you, the, part, the time that requires for a quark to be uh, behave as two independent quantities, that is the gluon and the other quark. And this is simply the invariant mass uh, of the, or the virtual mass of your quark system boosted to your, let's say, lab frame. And so this, uh, again, is one of the, let's say, rules for time in which we can use actually to put in our parts and shower to have some sort of notion of space-time structure. And of course, again, uh, the hydronization, which again is taken from Pythia, but you still have some sort of modifications because you will not hydronize on only the, the final part, the particles of your uh, part and shower, but you also hydronize together or not, depending on the models again, uh, you will hydronize also with the recoiling particles that comes from the elastic, the, the elastic energy loss process that, that, that happened during the whole jet evolution. And that's why when we look for all the, let's say, um, uh, stay the, the picture of Monte Carlo models that we have, we have plenty of them because as you saw, 
we have a list, a huge list of choices to make, and which one of them will actually constrain our model in a given direction or the other. And I'm sure that this list will continue to grow. You will see some sort, some parts of it already included in Jetscape. And I think that the next years will also uh, be uh, more uh, in this in this list. So any question so far? Yeah, there is a question in Slack um, going back to the initial time tau zero for the crunching. So um, the question is what sort of a typical value for that and how accurate is the assumption that part on energy loss uh, sort of is not there before tau zero. So what, what sort of the uncertainty, I guess, in yes. choosing a particular tau zero? So what, uh, sorry, I think I, so this tau zero usually is what comes, so how people realized that this was an issue was that when trying to, to put this, uh, yeah, when trying to actually consider energy loss processes since the beginning, they would actually uh, yield more, they would uh, not be able to, to simultaneously describe uh, jet energy loss, which is the nuclear modification factor, for instance, and the amount of high PT uh, elliptic flow that you would get from your jet. So in when we try to describe this simultaneously, we cannot have some sort of, let's say, uh, energy loss, or we have to delay our energy loss until the the the, the hydrodynamic, let's say, uh, initialization time occurs. So this is still highly debatable, and we still don't know exactly how to model this. And what people realize is that the most, let's say, physics wise decision is to put exactly this time this tau zero with your hydrodynamic time. So your hydrodynamic profile comes also with some sort of initialization time that is the initial the time that takes until it reaches thermal equilibrium. And you would simply fine tune this parameter to this. Now of course you can change the T0 and changes in this T0 will reflect again in some sort of differences of your uh, elliptic flow component. Now, you will have more parameters in your model. And what people have been doing is exactly, okay, let's fix this to this tau zero because it's not the most natural choice to make. And then you fine tune, for instance, other parameters of your model, say, for instance, the density of, uh, of the scattering centers or some other parameter of, uh, of, again, the model. So yes, there are some uncertainties, but it's more of a physics-wise decision that says that, okay, I, I, in order to interact with some QGP, that QGP has to be in thermal equilibrium. If it's a fluid, then I will take this tau zero from my, my hydro. Hey, um, there's actually another tau zero uh, question from another student. Uh, and Liliana, I think you've already answered some of it. So let me just read it. Uh, um, and uh, you can decide what else you want to add. So um, the question is, what does tuning tells you mean? Do you study the effect that changing the switching time from initial conditions to hydro has on the jets? So your initial conditions need a strong notion of time evolution? Yes, yes. <laughs> so, so the, the latter is true, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. And I think this is a very interesting still exercise that, uh, I mean, our people are very uh, trying to get a sense of this. So for instance, in kinetic theory, they actually try. So the problem with this uh, tau zero is for instance, when you go, let's say if I go for a more simplistic model, that is the Bjorken expansion. So in some Bjorken expansion, uh, before tau zero, you actually expect that for instance, your Q hat um, actually explodes on some sort, right? So you have, uh, some disks that are described by color class when they said that you had the so-called Q hat on this on this kind of medium would be very very high, and for instance in kinetic theory what people have are trying now to to describe is exactly the evolution of Q hat from the let's say the time zero until tau zero, and they already accomplished some sort of smooth description of Q of Q of Q hats, but the problem still still remains on how exactly to couple this to our parking shower. So, but for now we still don't have any kind of, of solution. So, and the problem is that 
if we use our uh, energy loss models description as we know it to kind of push this towards times equals to zero, we will simply end up with a with non-existing uh, high PT flow. So perhaps this high PT flow can actually come from other source there that we still don't know. But for now, this is what we need to do to to describe it. Okay, I hope that answers the questions. If you have follow-up questions, just post them in Slack. Okay, thanks. Okay, so now with all these tools, one can try to, to ask the question, okay, so now that we have this he very heavy uh, machine, machine, machinery tools, what can we do with it? And one of the things is, of course, that I'm more of a jet person, of course, that I'm interested in the jet description just by itself. But if at the end of the day, we want to access UGP information, we kind of try to, to need to try to understand exactly how to relate this jet information to the quark moon plasma itself. And of course, we always see the quark moon plasma as some sort of quasi particles, let's say, but we still don't know exactly what is is interesting constitution because it's in it's what it will look like. It will depend actually on the virtuality or on the resolution scale to which we will interact. So we can see some sort of point-like particles if the, the, the energy transfer or the momentum transfer is high enough, or some sort of uh, thermal mass gluons, or something that is completely different as uh, some sort of uh, that doesn't have a PQCD. Uh, uh, description of it so we still don't know and of course to try to answer this one of the things is okay now that we have our model set up in a per perspective or in the perturbative perspective what can we say about the medium and what people have been working on is exactly to translate the information of jet energy loss into something that is related to the quark moon plasma and again if we go to this kind of picture in which i have my particle uh, interacting with the medium and acquiring some transverse momentum broadening, uh, I showed you that the the, um, the emission spectrum of my gluon actually depends on some on some dipole cross section that depends on some potential. So this collision rate is actually where it encodes everything about our medium. So this is where the Yukawa potential, for instance, in enters. But you can also try to use any other sort of potential. And the question is, how can we translate this into some effective parameter that can be compared independently of the details of your model? And that's why people remember, okay, let's look for the average transverse momentum square for mean free path that a particle acquires. And this can be uh, uh, connected to this dipole cross section that and this also means that if your model does not have exactly some q heads you can translate some some parts of your model into some q heads through this dipole cross section because the dipole cross section is something that is inherent to this kind of models so this means that okay if i measure some jet energy loss i can connect this to this parameters, this transfer coefficient that you had, that is again related to some sort of the Brownian motion of my particle. So in this kind of language, energy loss and momentum broadening are deeply connected. And so I can now use my model and try to get all of the data that I get from single particle, jet suppression, et cetera, et cetera, and try to fit these this, 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 uh, this results and recover the Q hat. And this what uh, and this is the result that you get with several different models that you find in the literature. Uh, of course, this is not uh, now uh, up to date, although this is just from last year, but of course people continue to work and improve all these kind of things. And what you'll see here is basically that, okay, qualitatively, we have some sort of picture for the Q-hat evolution as a function of temperature. But when we look to the details, we still don't have exactly the most accurate, let's say, uh, evolution or parameterization of Q-hat. And for instance, when you try now to look to the details of all the models that come in, changing the QGP initialization conditions will change the average Q-hat that you would get. Again, this is related to the tau zero that I mentioned. 
Uh, the fact that you include energy loss during the whole part and shower or just during the final uh, stage of the evolution can also compensate the average that the average you had that you can withdraw from these models. If you in, use some sort of improved Bayesian analysis, and you will actually have some lecture on this, uh, and well, now with Xcape, this becomes much more uh, uh, user friendly, let's say, these kind of methods, then this will, in principle, also seems to yield a stronger temperature dependence. I'm not sure um, uh, the, the, the exactly how come uh, is this, but in, this is, seems to be uh, one of the, of the effects. So this would be very, very easy, actually, to understand. Uh, and the others is, for instance, to include different data sets, of course, because don't forget that every time that you pick a data, this means that you will bias your sample. For instance, if you put um, boson hydrogen correlations, then they are dominated by quark uh, uh, samples. If you consider inclusive particle spectra, then you will have a mixture of the two. And there is also the effect of the medium response that will be uh, if higher if you pick jet measurements as respect to hadron. So this means that you also be more sensitive to your, the parameters of the medium response model that you will choose. And all of this together uh, brings this picture in which we still have some, I mean, it's not exactly, it's much better than it was uh, a few years ago when basically a few points were, were in these plots. Now we will see some sort of more busy plots but there are still some uncertainties and we need to work a little bit more on this. But in any case, this is, was, if you want, one of the few examples actually in which we can make some sort of quantitative assessment of the QGP characteristics using uh, uh, jets and in this case also uh, high momentum particles. The other, for instance, is medium response. So medium response, as I, as I mentioned, uh, comes from these uh, elastic scatterings and this is where things might be a little bit more uh, problematic as soon as you go for lower and lower momentum scales. But this is actually something that has been uh, been developing very, very, very strongly on Monte Carlos. And in fact, was uh, with, this, uh, with uh, this consistent data comparison uh, with, with the Monte Carlo results that people realize that without medium response, we wouldn't be able to actually describe, for instance, the jet mass or the jet radial profile. So the jet radial profile is just the momentum or the particles that you will find along your jet from the center of your axis to the peripheral. This is some sort of decreasing uh, uh, distribution. And when you make the ratio with respect to PP, what we know is that, okay, the core of your jet seems to be unmodified. Again, with this picture that your vacuum structures are some, somehow preserved in the medium, then you'll see some suppression. Again, effects of medium induced energy loss, but then you see some sort of enhancement. And this enhancement was, if you want, one of the smoking guns for the first, uh, let's say, um, proposals for medium recoils. This you can see, for instance, with Martini or with LBT, you still need this sort of uh, component of this medium response component in which one in, in, in uh, uh, both of these models to actually describe the data. Now, the problem comes that as soon as we include this kind of component, we also have an increase that keeps going as you go to higher and higher distances. And for instance, when we look for the jet, the nuclear modification factor of large radius jets with respect to small radius jets, we see that this increase in uh, basically all the models that include medium response so far, unless the hybrid, because the hybrid has a very small contribution from, from elastic energy loss, cannot exactly describe all these qualitative features. So we are still working on, but again, don't, worry, don't forget that we are uh, closer and closer to non-perturbative physics and all these measurements are actually heavily, um, heavily dominated by, by this non-perturbative physics, even in vacuum. So this, is, this poses an, another problem, but again, 
it's exactly the existence of all these different models that allow us to understand better and better the nature of this medium response. And this is actually one of the key signatures if we want to understand how the parkland plasma, for instance, thermalizes energy, how fast does it uh, thermalizes the energy, and how fast the jet thermalizes the, the energy within the jet. And one of the, 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 the key things is that what would be exactly the most, let's say, smoking gun of quark one plasma uh, of this of this kind of medium response uh, effects and this was again done in uh, or proposed using some sort of Monte Carlo model in this case the coupled uh, LVT model and in which they look for this Z plus jet events so you have the jet you have the Z the jet going on the other way up there and uh, the opposite direction and what the jet does is actually to kind of induce a negative weight on the away side. So this is what they saw as the soft hydro depletion in the photo in the Z boson direction. So they, che they check this on Z plus jet and also on photo plus hydron. Uh, but there's of course a catch. The catch is that when you try to look for these events naturally in lead lead and simply uh, subtract the proton proton events, you will end up with something that is not exactly visible due to MPI. Because the multiparticle interactions will happen also in proton proton, and this, of course, in the presence of quark and plasma, will also be quenched somehow, and you kind of populate this energy, these regions of, the, of your phase space, of your waste sites uh, uh, part of the events. And what uh, one of the proposals, again, possible within Monte Carlo studies was actually to select on events in which we already know that the jet had gone, uh, let's say, a significant amount of quenching. That is, if we take the PT of my boson as the reference for it, the initial jet, the initial jet PT, then I can select on more asymmetric events in which we are not sure, but at least they are dominated by quenching. And hopefully see some sort of uh, signal here. Of course, this requires more experimental control, but in any case, it's a very nice uh, proposal. And again, here is where we can test more things on, on uh, our hydrodynamic model. For instance, the equation of states uh, parameters will affect on how exactly this kind of wake, this depletion and the magnitude of it will uh, actually appear. Uh, in 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 experimental results, uh, Liliana, uh, mm -hmm. if we can wrap up in uh, the next couple of minutes, that would be great because uh, we yeah. some time for questions at the end. All right, thanks. Uh, so actually, I was about to stop just to ask if there are any questions. Nothing new on Slack. Okay, so. Then I move to the last part, which is the other big advantage of using actually Monte Carlo and generators is to understand biases. Because the comparison between quenched and unquenched is always made through some jet selection. And so when we compare PP and light LED, we are always uh, are, we are always faced with this problem that we are not sure if we are comparing exactly the same jets. On top of that, we usually, when we look for the jet substructure, we also apply some grooming. And this means that I'm selecting on jets that have a given topological configuration. And again, this means that when comparing PP and lead lead, I might not be able to compare apples to apples directly, but some sort of bias distribution on one side on proton, proton with other biases on lead lead and this again will difficult the exercise of having of withdrawing something meaningful out of the quark -like plasma and for instance this was uh, an exercise done again with the, with the, with the monte carlo approaches in which they try to actually for instance understand what would be the jet's uh, radial profile when i select on some sort of jet pt and this for instance in hybrid we have proton-proton uh, in dashed lines. And as you can see, with response or without medium response, we all we seem to, to have almost no effect. But if we trigger on the Z PT, which is our, let's say, reference, then we see an enhancement. 
And this means that depending on how we make the, our jet selection, we are more likely to have stronger contributions of medium recoils. And this means that we, if we know exactly what we, what, what we are selecting, we can use exactly this grooming to actually select different contributions of medium response and compare uh, models in a more uh, transparent way. The other thing, for instance, is exactly this kind of formation time that can also select jets with different degrees of, of quenching. Uh, for instance, I can use exactly this proxy of formation time independently if it's, uh, let's say, a physical quantity or not. So I can use it to kind of select jets that have, for instance, a shorter formation time or a larger formation time. And this will induce or will select basically samples of jets that are strongly quenched or basically whose nuclear modification factor is compatible with one. And this means that they will need uh, in, undergo any kind of jet energy loss. And one of the things, for instance, is actually, again, to understand what kind of biases are we making when we put this kind of formation time uh, uh, bin in our jet selection. And this means, for instance, this is still work in progress, but what we have been seeing is that this formation time does not have any kind of particular, let's say, sensitivity in proton-proton. Again, the formation time in vacuum is not actually a quantity that we really care about. But in lead lead, again, we see this nice separation between quenched and unquenched, and what we would naively call as early or late forming jets. And of course, the question is if this has indeed some physical realization in vacuum or in medium. And again, this is again an example of things that we can do right now at the Monte Carlo that still is not uh, possible or is still not being done analytically. So to conclude, uh, the part and showers, of course, that we are still bounded always by uh, the accuracy of proton proton collisions, but we have a very qualitatively problem, a very qualitatively different problem that is a quantum system that is developing on top of an evolving medium. So, this puts not only the question of how exactly we interplay the part and shower with the evolving medium, but also how to actually make this transition from perturbative to non-perturbative, because now we have this problem much more, uh, much more present in our, in our approach. And I think it's a very nice way to actually try to understand more about these, these, these things. So, and this basically concludes my, 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 my presentation. So I hope I could uh, give you more or less what are the, the, the items or the things that we need to worry about uh, to put together, let's say, a Monte Carlo event generator that is uh, targeting heavy ions. And uh, although they have their limitations, we are still bounded to the Monte Carlo truth that is within that model. We can still use it to test new observables in more realistic conditions, to actually perform some more phenomenological studies that are a little bit ahead sometimes of our analytical understanding and also understanding the biases in our experimental results. So that's it. Thank you. So we do have a couple of questions on, on Slack. So one is, um, I think it goes back to slide 40, maybe. Uh, let me just read this. It says, why is there an enhancement again after delta R of 0.2? I think that, well, yeah, I think this one. So this enhancement of uh, above R.2 is basically with uh, the medium response. So in this model, the hybrid, you also have it. So you have your jets and your jet kind of propagates through this, uh, this uh, strongly coupled medium. And this will basically result into some correlated background that actually propagates in the direction of your jets. And it doesn't sit, sit exactly very on top of your jet axis, but it's more like the contribution that starts to increase on this side here. This is exactly what happens, for instance, when you look for the other models. For instance, you will see these components of the medium response rising towards larger and larger distance. And you can see that the ratio, for instance, above one is more or less around 0 0.2. So this is where you see- But in PP yeah. also, the, the announcement is there. So there is no medium, right, in PP. The PP comes exactly from uh, the jet selection bias. So if you trigger on some jet PT, final jet reconstructed PT, you are taking into account also the fact that 
uh, you will lose from your jets, jets that naturally would end up in that if it wasn't for the part and fragmentation, let's say, function. Uh, if you trigger on the Z instead, then you are sure to grab all the jets that were initiated with that AT, in this case, ATGV, independently if the part and shower actually now afterwards uh, fragment your jet and you will end up losing some particles out of your jet cone simply because, you know, quantum mechanics comes into play and you just radiate. So if you want, this would be actually, it's not exactly uh, some sort of uh, enhancement. This would be, let's say, the natural uh, jet radio profile of your jets. And because you reconstruct, you put a cut on the final reconstructed jet, you will lose these jets because these jets will likely have a smaller jet PT. And because they have a smaller jet PT, then this means that your particle distribution is more narrow now. Okay. So part particle distribution will be narrower at larger jet PT or smaller jet PT? Sorry? I mean, the particle distribution will be narrower in uh, higher jet PT or lower jet PT. So if so the point is that imagine that you you, you start with the ATGV jet or ATGV quark. If your jet is narrow or if your part and shower is narrow, then you will end up with an ATGV jet and you will have kind of this profile. Because all your energy of your vacuum shower is still recovered within the jet radius. But if you now have a part and shower fragmentation that is somehow wider, your jet's radial profile now becomes wider, but you will most likely fall outside of the selection. Okay. So this is always an effect of uh, jet selection. We all, all, all we in LabLab, we also go, uh, uh, this, this jet selection bias is always and always going into, into play. That's why it's also so important to understand exactly what kind of biases are we including. Because, of course, high momentum particles are more narrow because everything is boosted. Uh, but our interpretation on exactly how these things goes of the medium in the showers on top of this can actually vary. Okay, thank you. Um, we had one more question on Slack. Um, about the, uh, okay, so coming to the jet recoiling part using Monte Carlo, is this done only for semi-inclusive jets or does it also explain some other case of inclusive jets? So I guess the the interplay of the triggered and the non-triggered maybe, um, can you say uh, something about this, that? This one? Um, I don't know if it refers to a particular slide. So if, Arjita, if you're in, do you just wanna uh, unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I think it was on slide 4040. Like next slide, maybe. Yeah, uh, somewhere here, I guess, like where you were hinting at uh, the LBT model and the other models describing the jet recoil part. Uh, you mean this one? Uh, yeah, right. So here I wanted to know, like, um, is this specifically for the semi-inclusive jets or it's mm, the model also explains in case of inclusive jets? So this signature of the jet relu profile, actually this is for instance for uh, coincidence measurements and this is for inclusive. So the jet radio profile, you actually qualitatively, you always see the same independently of its uh, coincidence measurements or uh, some inclusive measurements. I don't know sure okay. if this was your answer. Yeah, 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 you answered it. Thank you. Nothing else on Slack? Okay. Um, this, are we going into the general discussion session then? Or Yes, I think that's good. Yeah. Uh, any general comments or general questions for either one of the talks? Yeah, we're, we're actually at very much our, 
<laughs> the end of the yeah the okay. three hour mark but we can still take some questions and uh, also thank the speakers both uh, Jorn and Liliana very much for the wonderful talks uh, just so your stock is updated on the Indigo page. So Liliana, if you are not able to just send it to me and I can always up upload it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So yeah, keep putting your questions in the Slack, but because we are a little bit late, uh, just you can also ask it here before we close. Um, I have a question. So will the recordings be uh, uploaded on the Indico page as well? Yes, they will also be on uh, YouTube within the Jetscape channel. So they will be linked. Uh, and then you should be able to find it as soon as Zoom sends us the shareable link. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any more questions on Slack. So maybe we can call it a day. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, so we end uh, day one here. So day two starts tomorrow. We will have the hands-on session to start with. So, so you will uh, make sure you can use the Slack for your questions or the software. I saw some people already asking it with the Docker. Uh, I mean, we will still be looking at it, right? So looking forward to getting your own hands on and running uh, Jetscape. So thanks, everyone. We close today then. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.